Hey everybody, um, Joe Manning from History and Classics Department. I'm thrilled um, to welcome you. Thanks for coming. I know it's the last day before spring break and everyone is um, out the door pretty much. I really appreciate um, your coming to hear um, um, a very prominent speaker um, for us um, in the Yale Nile Initiative series. We're at the end of year two. Um, year three will happen. Um, just got funding for another exciting year um, next year, so stay tuned for that. It's been a really great couple of years so far, and I'm really thrilled that David Konievsky from Toulouse um, has joined us all the way from, um, from there, from southern France. It's a long journey. He's been a, here for a couple days, a very fruitful visit, um, a talk in Professor Harvey Weiss's seminar yesterday, which is really a master's class in how to reconstruct um, climates. Um, David is a paleoecologist, a paleoclimatologist with a PhD from, from Paris, and then he did a postdoc at one of my favorite places on the planet, KU Leuven. So we have that connection. It's a wonderful place. Um, and he's now uh, the director of the Ecolab um, in Toulouse. He's done a lot of fundamental work in reconstructing climates of the past in the Holocene all over the place, but particularly important um, for uh, his work at least caught my attention initially because of the um, work at the 3.2 Ka boundary, um, the so-called Bronze Age um, collapse or the Bronze Age um, crisis, reconstructing um, climate proxy records that might tell um, a richer story about what's going on in the Eastern Mediterranean about 1,200 BC um, or so. David, um, a warm welcome to you and look forward to um, your, your talk. So first thing, I will strongly thank Joe and Harvey for the invitation. So as you know, I'm French, so I hope you will all understand my English. Okay, if, if there is a problem, you can ask questions during the speech or just after when you want. So today, we're going to talk about what could be a pirate movie. But it's not a pirate movie. But it seems because we have invasion, we have a powerful nation, in fact, and we have major battle between the Gaza Strip and the Nile Delta. And as we know from this major battle, was located in this particular part of the Eastern Mediterranean simply because this battle was so important that the king, the pharaoh Ramses III, engraved his victory, this battle, and his victory against the different type of tribes in his mortuary temple at Medine Abu. So, and by engraving all this population, he referred for this population to the island in the midst of the sea. And the, all these tribes are better known now since the work of Gaston Maspero and other Egyptologists as the Sea Peoples. During, when we only look at the Medina Abu Temple, we mainly think that all these people came from the sea, so the Sea Peoples was a good term for the first approach of this, all these tribes in the Eastern Mediterranean. But the first thing we did is we have a lot of different information concerning the Sea Peoples. The, the main question is not who they are, because I'm not an archaeologist, so I can answer who they are. But I can reconstruct, using all the data available, the trajectories of the Sea Peoples in the Eastern Mediterranean. So we made a compilation, the first, I think, compilations of all the trajectories of, of everything was, that was available at the time. And first, we have identified that this invasion is not only sea invasion, but also inland invasion. So it's a mass of population migrating toward the Egypt. And what we can see here on this map is that the sea peoples, what we call the sea peoples, put fire to each the city they crossed and they sack each city from Pylos to Gaza before arriving in the eastern Mediterranean just to fight Ramses III. So, we often say that the sea peoples put fire to all cities and all the cities were often left unoccupied. So, this is a devastating wave of sea people in inland invasion at around 300, 200 years ago in the Eastern Mediterranean. Okay, so this is what is engraved on the wall on the Medinet Abu Temple. 
And the first question we have in mind is the CP points. If they are warrior, they are warrior, why they attacked the Eastern Mediterranean? And it seems more like these people were not warrior. They're probably refugees, political refugees, climate refugees, for the moment we don't know. But it's clearly that they are depicted with wife and children. So it's much more a mass migration of population toward the fertile area of Egypt than warriors and robot of at attack to settle in a new land. The CP points are really of importance because it's a chronological repair. It's the ANIC, the, the attack of the CP pole, correspond to the late Bronze Age crisis, to the end, end of the late Bronze Age crisis. So the late Bronze Age crisis, it's a period that was violent and disruptive in regard to cultures, social system practices, government institution, languages, ethnic identities, trade route literacy and the technologies. So a lot of different changes during the late Bronze Age collapse. What we know for sure, there is a social and economic and political crisis during this period. It's also the end of long distance trading and cultural exchanges in all the Eastern Mediterranean. And from this period of turmoil, emerge people, tribes, that we will all, that have overwhelmed the whole Eastern Mediterranean mass migration of peoples. And all the Eastern Mediterranean change from the palatial civilization to what we call small hamlet, the isolated culture villages of the Dark Ages. So everything changed after what we call the late Bronze Age crisis, the late Bronze Age collapse, or whatever you want. So there's clearly a big change. So we have put some pictures here of different type of sites here at the back. Tel 20 was really famous for this period. The first question we have in mind is when and where. When we can have the sea people heaven and where in Eastern Mediterranean. So we, have, we must have some evidences from archaeological site, because if they destroy the site, you must at least have a destruction layer, a burn layer, and some evidences that show you that you have a battle in the city. And this is what we got here at Tel 20 in Syria. Tel 20 is the southern most harbour town of the Ugarit Kingdom. So we have a perfect destruction layer, completely black due to the fire in the area, we have bronze arrowhead, we have fallen walls, broken pottery, so clearly there was a fight in the city at that time, during the, potentially the time of the sea peoples. And it's quite different in Cyprus, in the site of Pila Coni Cochinocremos, sorry, Cochinocremos, where we have not a fire event, but the population that lived here just hidden all the treasury before leaving the town, and they never came back. So why the Kandemir came back? Probably because overpopulation occupied the area. And the same thing for Tel 20. After, after the fire event and after the fight in the city, completely different populations occupied the area and with a Greek style pottery. So there's a replacement of population at that time. And we can date, radical bone date, on this layer to have if possible, an accurate chronology for this. And we have also Egypt, because we know that Ramses III defeated the sea people the eight year of his reign. So it could give a chronological issue for the sea peoples. So first, we better start by Egypt. So if we just check the accession date of Ramses III, because as, we, uh, as, uh, as I said, sorry, Ramses III defeated the sea people during the half year of this reign. That means that the first reign of the Ramses III was radical mandate to 1187, uh, uh, 96 or 1185 BCE. So eight years later, the sea people event in Egypt, the fight, the first fight, which is encarved on Medinet Abu Temple, could be located somewhere between 1188 11.77 BCE. 
There is other possibilities if we take into account the work of show of Arnold Ginter. It's just two other possibilities. We have apparently the same chronology. There's no major differences. Okay? So we know that according to this work, the Sea People, the end of the Sea People event in Egypt is around this chronological evidence. But here is not C14 radiocarbon chronology. So what we done at Tel 20 and Pilaco Criminos and also at Alacita Teke that we have date here we can clearly see destruction layer where we found a lot of seeds seeds. And it's important because it's short lived samples. It's annual. So we have a lot of olive stones and we have date of all of this olive stone to produce a weight average date here of 29.75, more or less 12 radiocarbon BP. And when we made the calibration for one sigma and two sigma, for the moment we will just keep the 68% one sigma, we have 12.25 and 11.90 car BCE. So the C people event in Syria must be during this period, this chronological range. We did the same thing for Pilaco Criminos. Here is where we found all the treasury hidden in the soil. And we have a lot of seeds, different seeds. Here is wheat. And we apply the same technique. We have date a lot of seeds. And we, have, we obtain this weight average date of 2960, more or less 10 radicabon BP. And the was sigma calibration give 1210 to 1190 Carl BC. So we're very close because the two sites are very close geographically. And here, when you just check the radiocarbon chronology, we have very close events. We have over C14 dates from another site in Cyprus called Alasutateke. We apply the same techniques. And once again, we compute a weight average date and we obtain 2971, more or less 15. And when you calibrate, once again, you find exactly the same calibration. Okay? So, for Syria and Cyprus, we have a chronological range, a first chronological range. But we can go further with this chronological range. If we mixed the three sites, it's just mathematic, so we can mix the three sites, and we obtain a date of 29.66 with a standard deviation of 6. So it gives for the late Bronze Age crisis, only in the Northern Levant, it's only in the Northern Levant, both 29.66 more or less 6, C14. That means that the C people event in Northern Levant should be in a chrono chronological range of 12, 15, 11, 19, Carl BCE. Okay? And it corresponds, this fact, to the end of the, the Ugarit kingdom. So it's the first step to have an accurate chronology. But we have over data, because we work with archaeologists, linguists, etc., etc. So we see that we can reduce the, the standard deviations. We have over dates, over C14 dates. Here is not for the Sea People event, but before the end of the palatial civilization here in Cyprus. Those uh, works from Manning and Eyal in Beniga and Jung. And each time in the transition from the late separate 2C to 3A and the late Elidic 3B2 to 3C correspond to the same chronological range. So uh, every day, every radiocarbon date for this event fall between at least 1210 to at least 1190 Carl BCE. So you have a very accurate chronological range. And when we go for deep uh, southern, in the southern part of the Levant in Israel, we have no date for the moment for the Sea People event or for destruction layers. But we have some red, we have radiocarbon chronology for the Philistine part of the Sea People, see, who be told to be settled by Ramses III in Canaan. So it's the date of the monochrome phase. And 
they obtain C14 date of 11, oh, just, well, <laughs> 1194 to 11 <laughs> for Cal BCE. And most probable age range correspond to 1195 to 1140 BCE. Now, we have other documents to reduce this chronological scale. For the moment, it's only radiocarbon data and chronological scale due to radiocarbon data. So we have the cuneiform tablet from Moras, Shamra, Ugarit. We have a lot of cuneiform tablets from this side. We have two main tablets found here. The first one is sent by the great Chancellor Bey to the last king of Ugarit, Amurabi. And we know by this tablet that Ugarit in Syria was still a kingdom at the onset of the 12th century BCE. And we know at least that yeah, there, is, there was the execution of Bey during Sipta's reign year 5. So the cuneiform tablet, RS, this cuneiform tablet, must be written before 1119 BCE. And this tablet is located, we found this tablet in the destruction layer of Ugarit. Second tablet we found in the destruction layer of Ugarit, it's the Kate, famous KTU 1.78. And it mentions this tablet, a sun eclipse day to the day two, the 21 January one, uh, 1192 BCE. So the destruction of the city and the fall of the kingdom must occur after this observ observation, because we have the observation. So just if we compile the radiocarbon data first, the Brighton, the historical data, the archaeological data, and the astronomical data, we can define a chronological interval for the invasion of the Sea People in Cyprus and in the Northern Levant. And we can say that according to all these things, the Sea People in Cyprus and the Northern Levant correspond to a phase, a short phase between 1192 and 1190 BCE. We have perfect fit with all these evidences. This is the first thing. For the moment, we have an invasion. We have people, migrants, or warriors, we don't know. But we have a, a radiocarbon chronology. And as it's easy to compute, to calculate, we ask ourselves if the sea peoples were in Cyprus and in Northern Levant during this period, and between Ugarit and the eastern part of the Nile Delta, it's around six, uh, 660 kilometers. And we have some different dates for the sea people in the Nile Delta, but they all fall in the same chronological range. That means that if you took the antique boats, the speed max was three, four knots. That means approximately 5.6 to 7.4 kilometers per hour. So from northern Syria to the Nile Delta, it will take, is in a navigate permanence, for four or five days. And is only navigated by day, it will take eight or ten days to be there. So, this is a chronological issue. issue. The minimum difference between these two chronology is two years, and the max difference is 16 years. So, Egypt was probably not the only goal of these people. They sack each city from Ugarit to Gaza. It's why it takes so, probably so long to arrive here in Egypt. So, now the question, we know when and where, is why. Why potentially we have invasion, we have the Sea People events. So, lot, yeah, there, was, there was a lot and there still is a lot of hypotheses. The first hypothesis, which is now completely abundant, that it was an earthquake storm during that phase in Eastern Mediterranean. The second hypothesis was a technolog technological innovation from the bronze to the iron. The first, third hypothesis was a changes in, in warfare, different type of spoon, et cetera. And the famous hypothesis for we have no proof that it's political struggle between center and periphery and all these people. So we use, it's not our hypothesis, it's Carpenter's hypothesis. Carpenter is an archaeologist 
from the 60s, who first say that probably a climate ever occur at that time. And so the only problem of Carpenter's is that he has no proof, he has no evidence of a climate change during that time. But he has right. So we develop this idea and we call this the 4.2 uh, event, sorry, just to make continuity with the 4.2 event. So this is the 3.2 event. And our hypothesis is that you have, at that time, a drought event, and this drought event leads to lower harvest, and this low harvest generates famine. People search for new fertile land to just to establish. So they migrate, there is a mass migration. But because drought was widespread everywhere in the eastern Mediterranean, when they arrive in the new places, new country, they find the same thing. And this new migrant generates conflict in, a new, in this area. So this is, for a moment, the hypothesis be behind the 3.2 Kaha BP event. It's just, for a moment, an hypothesis. So the first thing we do, we did, sorry, is we try to reconstruct climate variation during this period. So we use different techniques, different models, climate models. And here is the first step, because it's an old data, but it's still good. We have made reconstruction for the whole eastern Mediterranean using different sequences. Reconstruction of Tel Aco in Israel, from Cyprus, Alaska Deke, from Syria, so Tel 20, and from Tel Dan in Israel. And what we observe here is during that period, during a strong event from 1200 BCE to 850 BCE, we have a major change in precipitation. But something also quite important, it's not present everywhere, that sometimes you have a W-shaped heaven. It means that a drought phase, a uh, partly more wet, and then a drier phase. So this is the first approach. We know that everywhere in the eastern Mediterranean, we have this dry phase. And the problem we had at this period is that we have no data on Greece. And since then, two major seconds were published. The first one is a spelotem from Aleppo Tripa Cave, where they found exactly the same dry period at the time. And we can easily correlate what we found at Tel 20 with what they found in Spedotem. So it's, once again, exactly the same event. And we have a new, they have a new sequence at Mavi Tripakev, still mainland Greece, where the, the climate where it was so dry during this event that there is a hiatus in Speleotem, normal water in Speleotem. And here in Lebanon, at Jetakev, we found the same, they found the same event with a strong decline of precipitation, pre precipitation during that period. So you took Cyprus, Greece, Cyprus, Syria, here Lebanon, and then Israel, we found everywhere the same event completely dry for this event. But the problem we have, sometimes it's always the same, is that we want to quantify really the temperature and the precipitation for this event. So we have a new model based on climate for each season. So we can reconstruct the evolution of climate for winter period, spring period, summer period, and autumn period. It's really of importance because sometimes in certain country like Syria, you have the maximum of rainfall amount that, is, uh, that arrives in winter. And here it's just for temperature, but we want to see that if there is some difference during the year. And here it's just expressed as temperature anomaly for, the, for each period. Here it's a modern value, here is anomaly compared to the modern value. And we see that 
during his periods, at L20, we have a first cold period and then a very cold period. After the climate is completely different. And we can, uh, and we see that it is not dependent of the season. Each season is affected by this event. It's globally very cold. So it's the first time we can say that yes, the 3.2 event is a dry period, but it's also a, a very cold event. So just to be sure of our reconstruction, we extract only the winter period. It's already 1020. Here for temperature, winter temperatures. Here for winter precipitations. We have this famous W shape here at L20. And we can correlate the evolution of temperature at L20 based on pollen data, this climate model based on pollen data, with the key two Greenland temperatures. We have exactly here the same shape. Gives to two. It's cold in northern Atlantic, it's cold in Syria. And we also use well, it's all data, but we try to use this, this population, the density of population in Egypt. And we see that during that period, we have decreasing population in Egypt. So we have a very cold period, the same cold period that can be found in the northern, in northern sorry, Atlantic. Um, we want just to be sure, to try if we can have some correlation between our construction and other events. So here is the first phase between the late Bronze Age and the Persian period. Here we have no sediments. We have over sediment from the same area from the late antiquity to the subactual submodern period. And we apply exactly the same model for climate reconstruction, temperature reconstruction. And you can see that if we compare with written documents that indicate freezing events in the Bosphorus and cold winter in Istanbul, we have a very good correlations. So it means that our model works very well with all written documents. We are also, ah, we have also the severe winter, the last severe winter in Istanbul of this period. So that means even if we have not written documents for this part, we probably have the same accuracy, because if it works here, it works here. And we can correlate the first peak here, the very cold, dry peak, with an abrupt cold haven in the northern Atlantic. So we see, quite a bit later, the impact on agriculture. It's just to show you first that, that this event had an impact on agriculture. So, because we have cores at Tel 20, uh, next to Tel 20, in the Via River, close to Tel 20, we want to see if, if we can find the same evidences in the archaeological site. So we take some samples directly here in the archaeological site for Pilacocriminosa and for Tel 20. Oh, it's not climate reconstructions, it's just pollen derived biomes. But we see that during this period, just the period between the late Bronze Age crisis and the early Dark Ages, we have mainly in the site here, a xeric steppe, some taxa like desert taxa, xerophytic woodland, and most of all, we have a low level or one mixed forest. That means that the site is completely dry with the steppe that developed in, in situ. We apply the same technique in Cyprus, and we can say that the first peak in Cyprus is really important. We have a decrease of winter precipitation of 40%. And the second decrease, because it's a W shape once again, and second decrease correspond to 15%. We apply the same thing for winter temperature, and we see that when we have this strong drop in winter precipitation, we have the same thing with a strong drop of temperature during the same period. So the 3.2 event is cold and dry and especially cold, especially dry during the winter time. Yep. The situation was quite different at Tel Dan in northern Israel. We are here, completely in northern Israel, because we are in sources of the Jordan River, and you have always water in the sources, sources of the Jordan River. 
to reconstruct the evolution and environment here at uh, Tel Dan. And then what we found? Simply during the period when we have an abandonment of site, when you have the Sea People event, we have all this mass migration, the site was abandoned same way. And there is a heavy irrigation system at Tel Dan. And irrigation reservoir channels and slides were simply left to decay. And what we have in our paleological reconstruction is that the swamps expand. We have stagnant water everywhere around Tel Dan. And we compare what we found with the situation of the Hula Valley during the 13 and 14. And during this period, when the swamp expands and we have no moving water, the malaria expands in its place. And when you just check the inhabitants' settlements at Tel Dan, after this event, there is a decrease, a decrease, a decrease of population at Tel Dan. And we first think that with Tel Dan become a muddy wilderness infected by waterborne disease, mainly malaria. Why we can say that? Simply, when we work on malaria, you know that spreading of malaria since 8,000 years in Egypt, and we have a lot of data in different sites from Egypt, but potentially we have the malaria, so we can study the diffusion of malaria. And we know that from new, new publication, 10, at Tutankhamon, there is evidence of malaria, a bone necrosis in his feet. So we know that malaria was here at, at that period. We have, we have genetic fingerprint of malaria. And we also know that spreading of malaria starts in Canaan at 1500 BCE. So we can think that probably the migration of the disease of malaria took 400 years at least. And we can say that potentially during the 3.2 .2 event, we have malaria around Tel Dan. Simply because we create a situation that favor the malaria, stagnant water everywhere. Here is a modern stagnant water in a site at Tel Dan. When we apply, once again, the same treatment for Tel Aco, Tel Aco is in Israel, in the coastal area. Once again, we found the same here, I've underlined the same event. And just before this event, and we make the ratio of coastal sites to total, total sites, you have a strong increase during this period of coastal sites. And since this event, we have absolutely no data. We have a blank, a complete blank. Most of the sites along the coast disappear during that period. So once again, it could be due to the attack, it could be due to the climate, or it could be due to both for the moment. So we have the climate data, we have data on populations. It's always harder to, check, to mix the two. And in Egypt, it's harder. So I replace just because we use a lot of matrix from, matrix from um, Egypt in a reconstruction from the Eastern Mediterranean. The, be the best seconds is come from the Borus Lagoon. We have clearly a decline of sages. That means that you have less input of Nile water during this period in the Borus Lagoon. And we have an all curve from the Karun Lake. But clearly, it appears that also in Egypt, you have a decline sea wa uh, sea water, fresh water here in the, upper, in the lower part of Egypt. The situation is clearer when you go to Lake Tana, near the source of the Blue Nile, we have a very dry period for that phase. And as the Blue Nile fed the Nile, fed the Nile, you have clearly a change in the Nile flows during that period. Just to go in iron, those are like Neor, because we have once again dry is here. For the same period is 4.2, here is uh, 4.2, here. here is 3.2. We have a strong increase of dust in the lake at Lake Neor, showing that the eastern Mediterranean was impacted by drought, but also Iran. It's everywhere in the eastern Mediterranean coming to the Nihirst. 
So we compile all the data that we have for this event and we produce this type of evolution with the probability to have a dry eastern Mediterranean. And during the 3.2 event, we have clearly a edge spike. We are nearly 18, 19% of correlation of probability to have a dry event during that phase, during that period. So for the moment, we think that the climate, we'll see after, but we think that the climate event is a much more good evidence or hypothesis for the late Bronze Age crisis than the other hypothesis. Could be both the hypothesis works, but this one seems to be really demonstrated for this period. No problem. Once in, in my hand, I have population migrations, and on the other hand, I have climate. Okay, but how to produce a causal link? It's always the same problem because it's easy to compare to make some correlation, but we never know. So I just replace all these things. No, I just change and put a cold and dry event because it's not only a dry event, but a cold and dry event. Low harvest, famine, mass migration, conflict. And can we establish a causal link? And the first step, we think, for, for establish a causal link is to use the chronology. The, the question was, do we can mix the chronology? We take the cores, we take the CP poles, is the same chronology or not the same chronology? So we use all C14 dates we had for the onset of drought. All the 14 C14 dates we have for the CP poles in Syria and all the C14 dates we have for the CP poles in Cyprus. And we put everything in a matrix. It appears that we found the same chronological range that means that drought and CP4 invasions seems to be a chronological, a single chronological event. We cannot separate with C14 the two events. This completely goes in the same way. It's the first thing. The second thing is when you take a look at the cuneiform tablets from this period, the last cuneiform tablets, and from the latest from Ati and Egypt, and the period between 12, 5, 15, and 1195 BCE, he mentioned, directly mentioned on the Queen Farm tablet, famine and severe food shortages, and staggering increase in grain prices. We have a mention, direct mention, of year of hardship famine on this Queen Farm tablet. And we have our tablet, a picture of deteriorate, deteriorating condition in the Eastern Mediterranean, and we have the first famine aid ever recorded. We have an important letter from the eating king uh, Armuanda III, I think. He described the terrible hunger suffered by his father in Anatolia and indirectly mentioned drought as a sole reason. So we have clearly a link between the climate and what happens to the population at that time. If we go in Egypt, there was also famine event or episode in Egypt. Before Ramses III, during the reign of Ram Merenteth Merenta, so I just indicate the first reign of years, starvation affected the population and the pharaoh tried to alleviate the famine in Ugarit by sending consignment of grains. During the reign of Ramses III, there is a drop, there was, there was a drop in the Nile discharges with crop failures, low harvest, starvation, affect the population and you have riots. And from Ramses IV to Ramses XI, we have several episodes of famine, of economic crisis. It's the end of the Egyptian empire, a collapse of national authority, the looting of the royal tombs, and it finished with a civil war in Egypt. So all during this period. So the main, most important things that we have here for us, it's all this episode of famine because it implicates, yeah, it suggests that climate may have a role on this decline. So as we have everything like this, we just compute all the productual activities, all the two, what is agriculture during this period. Here, some things, uh, we use the same site. In Cyprus, Al-Sultan Al Al Teke, Tel Twin in Syria, Tel Dan in Israel, and Tanako in Israel. And we see that during this underlying period, each time during this event, you have a strong decrease of agricultural productivities. 
So we can make a direct link with the main zone of food, sh of food shortages and a reconstruction of form of impact of drought here in Eastern Mediterranean and uh, same thing for the two periods. So it's a model we produce with all the data that we had just to, see, to mention that we have exactly the same shape between the zone of food shortages and the zone where we have a strong climate impact in this area. So we have potentially climate, clearly a link between the two. So the CP poles, we propose and we use the habitat tracking theory of Harvey Weiss, which is perfect for this kind of things. That what is engraved at Medinet Habu is not warriors, but it's migrants, simply migrants with their wives and children. So it's family movement, a mass migration toward fertile areas just to have produce agriculture and find new land to establish. We propose that migrants fleeing drought and starvation seeking new fertile lands to settle. Air, potentially, their rank probably swelling each country across, also undermined by climatic stress and food shortages. So we wrote that the sea people symbolize the vast movement of population that lie at the heart of change for this key period in human society. After the sea people event, we have what we call the Dark Ages, and it's approximately 300 year Dark Ages. We have a lot of C14 date for this period, for the Dark Ages. And we, here, is, the example is for Tel 20. It's Tel 20 because we become, sorry, became a small hamlet during the Iron Age I. And everywhere here in Eastern Mitanian, we found the same thing, development of rural settlements, not more. And we have, Tertiani was probably resettled because you have two subsistence systems, mainly due to the fresh water from the Rimera River and the Enfawar. But it's not the case for each site. So if you have water, you have people. If you have no water during this period, you have no people, and the site was completely abandoned. And we have a revival of the harbor town around 850 BCE. It's the end of the Dark Ages and a renew for, for culture, for exchange, etc., etc. So just if we summarize, for this period, for us, it's a cold and dry heaven in Cyprus, Syria, Israel, and Egypt. And in some areas, particularly at Tel Dam, potentially, we have a spread of disease in swampy areas. And what we have computed here or calculated is that we have also a strong decline in agricultural productivity. When we take a look at the population, it corresponds to a severe food shortage, starvation, so generates vast movement of population, families, not warriors, but families. And simply, when they arrive in a new town, generates conflict because this town or this country is always undermined by drought, too. And if we just check the chronology, we have a first approach of chronology. For the moment, we have no over chronology, so we keep this one. So between 12, 15, and 11, 90 BCE for the CP poles. We thought that the CP pole in Northern Levant is between 1192 and 1190 BCE. And the last the fight of Ramses III against the CP pole corresponds to a period between 1188 to 1177 BCE. So we just wrote that climate was probably an element associated with the crisis and its consequences, the decline of empire and kingdoms of the East and the following Dark Ages. And we saw now it's mostly during the Dark Ages. We thought first that the climate was worse during the, the late Bronze Age crisis, and we see now that it was worse during the, late, during the Dark Ages. This is what we have a lot of small hamlets everywhere. It was too cold and too dry to produce agricultural activity and restart exchange all in all the Eastern Mediterranean. So I will finish with my two friends and collaborators. We have very precious uh, with Mariner and Christophe Morin. Many thanks. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Great, David. Fantastic. Um, and exactly at 50 minutes. So that's really, uh, that's. <laughs>
um, and with your jet lag, amazing performance, <laughs> I think. Um, we would entertain questions, yeah. a few questions. Um, I'm going to start off by asking about what this climate event is, because you're, the, the main data you have here, this W curve, I mean, could it be, for example, a couple of pretty big volcanic shocks? Because um, that, that W curve looks like it's two severe cold events, but not really long term. But the other part of the story is um, a mega drought, right? It's a long term severe drought. It's not just two shocks induced by volcanoes, which would certainly uh, affect the Nile River flow, we know, but, but, but elsewhere too. So uh, how do we understand this event? Is it a, is it a mega drought of uh, a couple hundred years um, across um, Met Eastern Mediterranean or further? Or is it, um, can you understand it simply as a, a couple of um, shorter term shocks that had I, knock on effects? I've, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, it was a mega drought because when we construct the precipitation, we have more precipitation in, during summer and less during winter. So the, much more for this episode, a change in seasonality. It, it means yeah. that you have less precipitation during winter during the main rainy season in Syria and more precipitation during the summer. But the problem that we have during summer is that we have higher evapotranspiration. So that means that you have no more precipitation in Syria. So it's, this is the first thing. It's, it's harder for the moment to understand why we have this change in seasonality for, during the short time period because mm -hmm. it was very short. And maybe for, for, for the moment we just search for everything coming from the northern Atlantic and try to find link between general circulation for climate, we could, be, we could potentially add the climate, uh, the, the volcanic events and, 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 yeah, and, uh, and, and see that we have, okay, general circulation modification, much more, and we superimpose volcanic activity and could be harsher to simply, simply it's in French, <laughs> because okay, we have the two events in the same time. Yeah. It's possible. We, we, we must check this. Can you go back to your, your, the main slide uh, with your, your data? Which one? It shows, shows the two uh, cold events. Ah, yeah. Is this one? Oh, no. Uh, uh, before? That might work. Well, that might work. Yep. I mean, th those look like discrete shocks. To my ignorance, anyway. It could be. It could be. We, we must, if you have data, we can try, if we can try to correlate every, um, your, your, your data and this type yeah, of data. Because there is, there is new volcanic data, which is beautiful. For yeah, me. I know that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you give me your data, <laughs> I can tell you if yeah, it's that or not. Sure. Yeah. yeah so, we, but it, it would compound um, a, a, a severe drought, which is driven by insulation or, or something. Yeah, probably insulation first. Like yes. But maybe. Because it's very, during this period, it was very cold. We have anomalies of less six degrees. Yeah. Could, could be, uh, uh, yeah, it could, yeah it's, it's big, big, big. Right. There's no frozen here because less six is correspond to four, four or five degrees during winter. There's no frozen event. Yeah. But it's very cold for Syria. And maybe, as, we, as you said, mm -hmm. that we have two events in the same time. And the two events probably mix, maybe or not, or we will see, and giving this particular change and particular shape to the curve. We must test this. I think so. <laughs> yeah? Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. I wanted to ask if there is archaeological evidence for lower crop yields in the, uh, in the places that you mentioned. Yeah, uh, because we, um, we use, um, and as I saw, uh, show here, no, sorry. With a cuneiform tablet, because this is why I focus mainly on Tel Twenty, because it's the Garit Kingdom. It went a lot of cuneiform tablets from the Garit Kingdom, and we have diver, sorry, <laughs> right, I hear, and all these tablets is Ras Shamra coming from Ugarit, and all these mentions coming are, are coming from Ugarit. So we have local proof that there is a problem with crop productivity and paleoagronomy during this period. In another chart that you showed, there seem to be. Lower crop yields and lower ar <coughs> arboriculture. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, the full seconds, I think. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So just like <laughs> I write <laughs> here, this one, or not? Because here you have agricultural productivity, and because I just want to show that is first approach, that when we have this 
makes the strong uh, climate happen, it corresponds each time to a decline in agricultural productivity. So we have the kiniform tablets telling you that there were lower crops in the area. You have pollen reconstruction showing you that you have lower crops in the area. So for a moment, everything goes in the same way. Okay. Up, up to see that. So you bring through the reconstructed precipitation yeah. and the uh, historical evidence from tablets. Yeah. And it's a, it's that's the evidence for I hope, yeah, process. we try to have the scientific data and all the everything coming from the side directly, the archaeological data, anything mixed together, we hope for a moment it seems to be very mixing together very well. So we can say that potentially what we have on cuneiform tablet is what we have here with the scientific data, with, or we will model our pollen reconstructions. Yeah? For your model of social dislocation, how important is the spread of malaria? Because your decline of several degrees C would tend to suppress the vector <coughs> yeah. for fossil malaria. It's, it's very important because we are the more and more what, um, what we, we search in, um, in our analysis is different factors because we have, for, for the moment, one factor is drought or cold. Okay, we probably a lot of factors and disease is a big factor during this period because it was the first spread of disease somewhere here in Tel Dan, in the Jordan River. So at this time, we have no proof. For them, we, have, we know we have the, the environmental condition that favor malaria. And we, have, uh, we, have, we know we have to start to, um, to try if we can have some environmental DNA. So it find a fingerprint, a DNA fingerprint of malaria in our sediments. So the, the analysis start. For a moment, we have no data, we have no results, uh, and we have a lot of disease, and we just cr try to amplify each <laughs> DNA sequence we have in this cores and see if, if it fits or not with our, our database on genetic for all the disease. And it will be very important because if you sometimes have a disease that you have first the impact of climate, then you develop a, de uh, develop a swamp with fever disease, and the people never come back simply because you have this, the spreading disease in the area. Even if we have a renew everywhere, Teldan was completely abandoned. And it's probably due probably to Maria. We have not the fingerprint for the moment. I hope we have this. We'll see. Yeah? I have kind of a complicated question. Um, I really appreciated your showcasing that generational gap between the initial evidence for the destruction layers at Ugarit and then the subsequent evidence for the yeah. Sea People's invasion of Egypt. I was curious what you had to say about the lack of destruction layers in Lebanon and the Phoenician, what became the Phoenician cities. Um, because in your Kind of your explanation for why it took that long for the sea peoples, these northern sea peoples, yeah. to make it to Egypt, um, you suggest that it's all of the cities lying in between northern Syria yeah. and southern Egypt. But we don't have any evidence that sea peoples ever sacked any of those cities between, at it's least between <coughs> southern um, southern Syria and uh, Tel Aviv. So that's the first part of my question. The second part of my question is if you could hypothesize that in fact what the Egyptians are calling sea peoples are complete, they're, they're refugees, but they're completely unrelated refugee populations. Yeah. Because if you look at evidence that is actually contemporary, if not preceding the destruction of Ugarit in the time of Merenapta, so the evidence from the um, mortuary temple at Merenapta, which is not as extensive as, as Medinat Habu, but does mention Libyans and then some unidentified mm -hmm. peoples that are later mentioned in Ramses III's descriptions of this event, um, you see that there's, there's almost a, a, a fad towards accumulating as many foreign ethnics within these battles as possible in, in order to showcase uh, the yeah. extent to which the king is managing foreign populations in Maine. So I was wondering whether um, the nature of the evidence is in fact uh, impacting the interpretation in that we, we are interpreting all of this as a singular kind of migration stream, right, around from the northern Mediterranean down through uh, across the eastern Mediterranean to Egypt. Um, and I was wondering if that gap in the Levant is not evidence for, in fact, two separate migration streams, one that impacts uh, the Syrian population at Ugarit um, and then stops there, 
one which impacts Egypt economically, but not demographically. Yeah. And then a second um, similar event, a generation later, um, that impacts Egypt, and that the Egyptians spin in the same terms that the previous event had been spun. Yeah. Because all of, that, all of the evidence from Egypt is coming from Thebes. So, I mean, your average Theban is not going to know any of this. And we don't have any evidence from no. the Delta cities of uh, similar propagandistic I know uh, this is, this is a, for, for the first part of the question and then the second part of the questions. Yeah, for the moment we have the problem because I just put apart Lebanon because it's quite complicated in Lebanon. But in, in Israel, we have first a lot of separate date, as they say, Pikachu and others, that correspond to destruction layer from the sea peoples. It was first published. And then they say, no, it's not destruction layer, finally, it's over things and whatever you want. So we have a, a prey model with all this city destroyed and published as destroyed by sea people during that time. But when we compute all the C14 dates and you are where you are right, there's no only one wave of sea people. There's X wave of sea people. And for the moment, because we have just computed a carbon, radiocarbon datation for Tier 20, it seems like there's one event. And now we, if we just, is the area for, for the communication, but if we really data, we see that at, Tier 20 and like the oversight everywhere in the Mediterranean, you have different deflagrations. It's not one event. This is one, not, one, not one population in the time. It's different population moving in the eastern Mediterranean at the time. And this, this for what? Sometimes when we search for correlation between a site in northern Levant, a site in southern Levant, etc., etc., that means nothing. Simply because it is the first wave of uh, migration and then the second wave and third wave and etc., etc. This is why usually the first dates that were published by, for Israel were completely different from the dates that we have in the northern Levant, simply because it probably means a second wave of migration in that area. And for the moment, the, the main problem uh, for Israel, for the moment, we will see against yeah, yeah, Lebanon thereafter, but for Israel, is that the archaeologists don't want to hear about the Philistine and anything like that. And Okay, uh, I agree with, with all these archaeologists that probably Ramses never put the Philistine in Canaan. It's never, it's probably they arrive and settle here at that time. But when you check the chronology of the Philistines in Canaan, even if they settle by themselves in Canaan, it's completely coherent with all the sea people event, the, at a large scale for the sea people event. So, once again, we need more data. But the problem is if you publish something and you change the thing you published, because you say, oh, no, finally, this is not that, or this is a different type of uh, data that I have in hand, it could be very hard for us. But concerning Lebanon, this is quite different, because we worked in Lebanon. And we have this event. But they refuse for uh, us to be dated and to be studied. Because for her, Lebanon is one population since a very long time, and then there's no, there is no invaders in Lebanon. It's much more nowadays political than really scientific. But there is data from Lebanon. We have calls from Lebanon. We have, uh, I think, uh, 10 calls from Lebanon from each city destroyed by this wave of migration in Eastern Mediterranean. But for the moment, we wait a changing government, it probably will be a bit more open, and we can, I hope, publish and uh, all the stuff we have in hands. In Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but you are right. So, 100% right. There's one, there's not one event, there's a lot of events. Mm -hmm. Yep? Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have a few questions on the um, African side of your day, uh, data. The first is, it seems to me one of the missing pieces in the jigsaw puzzle is Libya, just because, as the previous question alluded to, the Libyans uh, feature just as much an Egyptian text in this same period as sea peoples, in fact, almost more in the range of Maritime. So, whatever events would necessarily affect people in the Levant, the North would also affect Libyans. And I was just wondering if there is any of your climate study that suggests that this exact same event is affecting the Libyans. The second part of my question is, you said that there was less agricultural productivity on the Nile, which I completely agree with in the documentary text. But in order for that to be true, don't you have to have less rainfall in the Blue Nile, so all the way down to Ethiopia? So is this event mm -hmm. much larger than the map would mean? Yeah. We actually have this yeah. affecting not only the Near East, Middle East, Turkey, Mediterranean, but almost all of North Africa as well. What we have for the moment, for two words, Concerned Egypt is found the same chemicals that we find everywhere. But it's quite 
could be quite different because the Nile. And the Nile is always fertile, it's really bigger. And even if we say you have contraction of the Nile, we talk about the contraction of the Nile, or thing like that, you have always flow Nile. So probably you have some branch, some small branch that dry up completely, but it's impossible to dry all the Nile. So the situation, whatever happens, is completely different in Egypt to the rest of the whole Eastern Mediterranean. And for the moment, we have new cores from the Red Sea, and we will see how the climate event is recorded in the coastal area to the Red Sea. And it's really of importance because there is no Nile influence in this part. So we will see that if Egypt was really impacted by the same climate change, how Egypt was impacted, and then we can say, we can try to, to imagine the value of the Nile during that period to conserve population, to maintain population where everybody is a drought everywhere. Everywhere is drought everywhere, sorry. So I think that from the, the case of Egypt is quite complex. It's always complex because, well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's better to work in northern Levant. It's, it's easier than to work in Egypt. And, and the problem that, uh, that we all have in Egypt, except Joe, for us, it's a big problem, that we have no authorization to, to core in the Nile Delta. So for the moment, we have no direct data from the Nile Delta. And we have tried because we have a project based on Alexandria, in our, in our city Alexandria. But what is, there is a lot of mixing sediment in this part of Egypt. So we have not perfect core, we have nothing, we have no, no climate data. We have m m much more urban data, how people have removed and changed the sediment due to the installations of lots of inhabitants, but not climate. So for the moment, I, I have no pr accurate answer for that. We must wait the other studies, and may maybe <coughs> our first studies in Red Sea will give some more data. Probably the study of Joe with all this volcanic event and potentially climate event will give also new data on that data. When after, when we have all the data, we can start to apply new model and see the real impact of this climate or other climate event. In, on the Nile Delta and on the population that li lives along the Nile Delta. This is, why, this is for what is really imp of importance, as we said just before, to study the disease. Because even if you have more water, sometimes it means that you have drought, you have less of a, a reduction of flow in the Nile Delta, and probably in the bank you have some flow of, uh, stagnant water. And during that time, probably, maybe, we have more disease than during the period we have uh, a very rapid flow, a quick flow of Nile data. So this is why we search for fingerprint, DNA fingerprint, and things like that. Actually, it's okay. Oh, no. Well, I think the uh, poles have a 3.2K event at, at Karun, as Wilcher and Marx. Yeah. In, in the Karun Lake. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, and I know that the uh, sources of Lake Tana and the Blue Nile are 50% Mediterranean and 50% Indian summer monsoon. So the trick, I think, is to get the record from Mamluk Cave and uh, from Alina Gish's core in, in, in Pakistan to get the 3.2K event for the 50% of the uh, Blue Nile flow from the Indian summer monsoon. So we know that it's already been diminished in the Mediterranean. Yeah. So now we have to get the Indian summer monsoon component for the Blue Nile. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. <laughs> for the Blue Nile, totally. <laughs> we, we, so we I, I, I think they would check Mamluk Cave uh, for um, 3.2. I don't recall I'm not sure. that or not. I think it's, it's during 3.2, Mamluk Cave is wetter. We have a, a, a decrease in 018. That means that wetter period during spells. If I will remember, I must check that. I think it actually doesn't even. No, Mamluk Cave, in fact, does not go to 3.2. No. So we've got to look someplace else. Yeah. But um, I think that's the uh, going to be the source of um, our data for the Nile. For the other 50 percent. Mm. We must check. Yeah. Just to be sure, and apply a new model when we mix the two, <laughs> and see. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Thank you for that brilliant presentation. No way.
ecological response. Well, I just, you know, <laughs> that corresponds in the delta with the abandonment of Pyramesis and the movement to Tanis. Uh -huh. So there's a big event on the Pelusiac branch, which Egyptologically people just tend to say, well, it must have silted up or something, and they abandon it. And they literally haul obelisks and colossi over to Tanis um, at the end of the Ramesses period. So the, in the 1180s? Or, yeah, or right or, after. So there's a big event. Something, something renders Piramesa unserviceable. And they literally move the city, the monuments themselves, to Tanis. So, <laughs> so something happens with the flow. Something affects the, mm. uh, the channels mm -hmm. in the Gulf. Mm. And the other interesting thing, the the um, um, the Merneptta, um inscription about the Libyan invasion, which does come along the north and actually impacts Memphis, and it's recorded both in Thebes and then on the uh, the famous uh, victory column of Merneptta from from Memphis. Um, the interesting thing is that the Sea Peoples appear there, but they appear more as elements who are sort of goading on the Libyans, and they do come with their particular military equipment. And they do arm the Libyans with these long swords that are not typical in Egyptian depictions of the Libyans. So you get this feeling that there maybe is something going on much, much farther afield that is pushing certain groups out and they are bringing a type of military technology with them mm -hmm. so that there is a really complex social issue mm -hmm. going on here that the Libyans are on the move for some reason, but they're kind of being goaded on by these other groups that keep popping up during these events. Hmm. Interesting. And of course, we should talk about Ramses III. We at least mentioned the assassination of Ramses III, which also uh, is symbolic. Oh, and, and also we get a shift from, uh, we get a, 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 there's a flip-flop at some of the desert sites I've worked on. There's a flip-flop in the ratio of barley to um, emmer that we suddenly get massive amounts of barley being shipped along these roads mm -hmm. during the late Ramesses period, mm -hmm. and there's a drop in the amount of emmer. Yeah. Um, I don't know what that means. Barley um, is a is much hardier crop. It is, so. and it also corresponds to changes we see um, textually in the prices of grain. Uh -huh. So there is nice. there's something going on yeah. right there. Yeah, great. Great. Wonderful comments. Um, yeah, more work to do. Um, David, thank you so much for coming and giving us two very stimulating, cutting-edge uh, talks the last couple of days. Thank you for coming. Have a great break. Thanks a lot.